you really read the same book every day? Will you read some to me? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Did you write that? Yes, I did. Really? No. <laughs> With the title alluding to the many books contained within the Bible, it comes as no surprise that on the surface, the Book of Eli is a film about Christianity, but it's much more complex than that. While our protagonist Eli is as devout a man as they come, the Book of Eli doesn't hide away from the folly of religion, such as the potential to manipulate and spark historical conflicts. Beneath the overt discussions of Semitic religions, the Book of Eli also touches on the theme of preserving knowledge and how, without it, we're doomed to make the same mistakes of the past, something explored extensively in the now legendary mid-century novel Fahrenheit 451. Our protagonist Eli is a man with a singular quest to take the final copy of the Bible West, a quest he was supposedly given by God. Opposing him is Carnegie, a local warlord and the leader of a shambolic frontier town who seeks a copy of the Bible for nefarious reasons. The Book of Eli's post-apocalyptic world is a bleak one. Thirty years after a great war, which opened up the sky, food is scarce, water scarcer, and amid every piece of broken detritus are others wanting to take what you have. Eli has purpose and has devoted himself to the singular task of safeguarding the book. But given the fact that he's played by Denzel Washington, he's obviously not your usual devout man and is willing to fight to ensure his quest reaches its conclusion. Simply put, the entirety of the Book of Eli revolves around the ideas of faith, the value of religion, and the preservation of knowledge. But while it shows some of these values to be positive, it also acknowledges some of the greatest follies of Semitic religions. The concept of individuals being protected by God as they do his bidding is nothing new, with many stories in the Old Testament employing exactly this. As a blind man, Eli sure does have some incredible survival skills. Taking on multiple men with only a blade and accurately shooting a gun are certainly not on the cards for most blind individuals. Daredevil is a statistical outlier, folks, let alone quite literally surviving a few direct gunshots. But Eli lays bare his almost superhuman abilities in one simple line. And I know I would have never made it without help. Attesting to the divine protection provided to him by the God who gave him this task. I walk by faith, not by sight. Although we don't know it at the time, Eli means this quite literally. While his eyes have failed him, he's guided by his faith towards his ultimate goal. Similarly, Eli never truly claims to understand why he was given this task, only knowing that it must be completed. These themes of guidance resonate with ideas of fideism, which essentially argues that faith is independent of reason, suggesting that faith presents a unique way of understanding and interacting with the world. While this may initially seem old-fashioned, fideism has been defended by modern philosophers from Kierkegaard to Wittgenstein, who attribute it to the non-rational leap of faith. Could you help me? The wheel came off. And the only good thing about no soap is that you can smell hijackers a mile off. <laughs> Impressed. In the post-apocalyptic wasteland, life is fraught with people simply ensuring their own survival, but Eli's quest within the wasteland imbues his life with meaning and the reassurance of divine truth. On the surface, it seems as though the wasteland is a world without religion, and Eli is a prophet tasked with bringing religion back to the people, but the ending reveals that it's not quite as simple as that. Imagine how, uh, how different, how righteous this little world could be if we had the right words for our faith. Well, people would truly understand why they're here and what they're doing, and they wouldn't need any other uglier motivations. Like Eli, Carnegie covets the word of God contained within the Bible. However, he does so for a very different reason, making it incredibly explicit that he's searching for the holy text for personal gain, namely to manipulate people into following him. He explains, It's not a book, it's a weapon! A weapon aimed right at the, the, the hearts and minds of the weak and the desperate. We want to rule more than one small town! We have to have it. The Book of Eli even explicitly interacts with the idea that religion can be the cause for conflict. In fact, in this case, the Bible itself is labelled as starting the conflict which led to the end of the world as we know it. 
While this may be a fictionalized example of religious wars, such conflicts of course litter the entirety of human history, from the immense bloodshed, pillaging and more brought about by the Crusades or Inquisition, to the Eighty Years' War and even countless civil wars we see today. In a world where religious texts have been banished for supposedly causing a world-changing war, why then do we have a film about someone trying to protect one? When Carnegie's goons bring him an array of books that he doesn't want, he burns them. What about these? Burn them. This draws immediate parallels with Ray Bradbury's 1953 novel Fahrenheit 451, which takes place in a dystopian future where books are outlawed and government firemen ensure that any found book is burned. Much like Equilibrium, one of my favourite sci-fi films and an underrated classic we'll be covering soon. The protagonist of Fahrenheit 451 comes to realise that the dystopian society is using book burning as a way of suppressing dissenting ideas for change, and thus restricting the scope for individual thought and expression, something that we've of course seen time and time again throughout history. Dear Lord, we thank you for this meal and a roof over our head on cold nights such as this. It's been too long. It's just been long. Teaming up with Solara, the daughter of Carnegie's partner, to defeat highwaymen and most of Carnegie's men in the final shootout, Eli is ultimately shot in the stomach and has the book taken from him. Only problem for Carnegie is that when he opens the Bible, he finds that it's all in braille. With his blind partner Claudia feigning an inability to read the text, his Old Testament-like rule is put to an end. Rowing out to Alcatraz with Solara's help, where they're met by a group dedicated to preserving history, Eli dictates the entire Bible from memory to a scholar before dying of his wounds. Just like the Book of Eli, Fahrenheit 451 concludes with the formation of an independent group of intellectuals dead set on preserving information handed down to them through literature and art. So why are both Eli and this group of intellectuals so set on preserving the world of yesterday? The answer to this is best said by the leader of Fahrenheit 451's Intellectual Drifters. There was a silly damn bird called a phoenix back before Christ. Every few hundred years, he built a pyre and burnt himself up. He must have been the first cousin to man. But every time he burnt himself up, he sprang out of the ashes. He got himself born all over again. And it looks like we're doing the same thing, over and over. But we've got one damn thing the phoenix never had. We know the damn silly thing we just did. We know all the damn silly things we've done for a thousand years. And as long as we know that, and always have it around where we can see it, someday we'll stop making the goddamn funeral pies and jumping into the middle of them. Thus, the value of preserving the word of yesterday is to ensure that we never make the same mistakes again. We see this clear as day in one of the final shots of the film, where the curator places the newly printed Bible on a bookshelf in a full library between a mass of other religious texts. Despite Eli and Carnegie coveting the Bible as a world-changing text, in this library, it's simply another book on the bookshelf, another chapter of our defining history that must not be forgotten. By printing it without coveting its message and without putting the text on a pedestal as a symbol of truth above all others, the curator manages to execute the exact ideal presented within Fahrenheit 451, successfully documenting and preserving a text along with all others in the library so that the future can be informed by the past. People will come from all over, they do exactly what I tell them if the words are from the book. 